dear ones. You're listening to the What God Is Not podcast with Father Michael O'Loughlin and Mother Natalia. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to him forever. You can go ahead and answer Andrew Whaley. Oh, glory to him forever. <laughs> I didn't know if I was supposed to. I Wait, know. I, I, can I've I done talk before, before I, can I even, can I pray before I've been introduced to him? Yeah, no, we, we, we prayed together, but yeah. So Andrew Whaley's here. You've probably heard sister mention him a lot of times because she um, loves him immensely. And now he'll hear Sorry, mother, mother mention him mother, lots of mother. Times. No, I feel like when you said it that time, it was, it was accurate because right. we did hear sister Natalia talk about him many times. There we go. We're now we get to, to hear me. mother Natalia talk yeah. to me. So. Yeah. Mother Natalia. Are we switching over our, our email address now? Well, you just said it, so. All right. So I didn't say what the email address was. So I don't. Um, I don't remember. It's been so long since we set it up. You had such. You had such confidence in in God's will that you set it up like so long ago. But I don't remember what is the. So what is our current email address? I don't remember the domain. Okay, that I'm not either. So anyway, we will we'll we'll announce it soon. But it's it's we, well, this we, is we a just, crack unit here. I mean, we decided this. this. Is so awkward. I think it's at what God is not pot or W G I N podcast. Anyway, um, don't don't email us um until we, until we share what the real email address is. Continue to email us at the old email address, whatever it is. Um, <laughs> the, sister, old, the old email address is what God is not podcast at gmail dot com. Okay, so we we actually have a, oh I see well yeah we can't use it because we ha- we don't have our domain up anyway we're gonna switch it to mother and father at whatever the domain is um, yeah. because but we've That's had this cute. forever we've had this and for I'll like be coffee a, at. <laughs> you'll find out why that's funny and appropriate in a second when we introduce Andrew Whaley um, but yeah it was it was uh, I was like we, we've had this mother and father idea from long before you were mother and uh, and yeah so now we can actually use it because I think there's something there's something so appropriate about having a mother and a father on the podcast and so mother and sister father and sister <laughs> father and I sister you should do mom and mom at and dad at mom and dad the problem is that the dad at would never get answered. Like, uh, I I would not re- I would not respond a to one. a yeah. single email because because Mother Natalia is the only one who responds to emails unless she puts my name on it and she sends me a little note that says says Hey, um, you know you have these emails and you're at the airport right now. You should do them now. And I'm like, Okay, fine, Mom. Oh, I guess I guess she is Mom. So, <laughs> and <laughs> then, I, actually, then I get that was actually your response last time. It was. And then I was like, oh, when I get back to people, what did she say? I said, oh, I'm, I'm going to be at the airport for the next few hours. I'm like trying to be all jolly, like, oh, sister, looking forward to see you. I got to wait at the airport. I'll see you soon. And she's like, then do those emails while you're there. <laughs> you're going to you're going to have time. I'm like, whoa. OK. OK. Yeah, that's more Why like the actual inter- like a dude. <laughs> it's like the interaction between a, a, an actual mom and dad. Because yeah. if, if she was your mom, she'd be like, hey, bud, what could you do with this time? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Any, is there anything that you need to be doing that you could do right now? <laughs> I don't know. That's definitely not what she did. She said, while you're at the airport, return what God is not emails. That's not, like, that was the text. Yeah. It was that blunt. And, then, and I'm like and waiting then in line. Got, and, then, and then when you got here and we had dinner... Um, I was like, Father Michael, the emails. And you were like, I did. I answered them. And I was like, you didn't answer all of them. And and you were like, I did. I answered all of them. And I said, no, there's one more. <laughs> and you looked back and, and you were like, how did I miss it? And I was like, because it's from like two months ago. That's how you missed it. <laughs> you have to scroll way back in the email. Anyways, uh, one of these you brought days it up, I'm gonna not get, me. <laughs> I know. I know. One of these days I'm going to actually like get, I'm going to take a, um, a retreat like a week retreat and only do emails, like a staycation. That's not a retreat, Father Michael. I know. Okay, a, a week staycation. Don't call it that. Okay. And just do emails. I feel like the kid that's in the middle of their mom and dad fighting, <laughs> you know. And I don't want to pick sides, but I'm really comfortable <laughs> with the situation. Hey, who impacts your life more, Andrew Whaley? Is it Mother Natalia on that's the other side of the country, fair. or is it me who you you live in my house? Don't do that to him. <laughs> Don't do that. Well, you're such a. I mean, you impact me more, but I think she might love me more. I mean, (laughs) Uh, I can't argue with that. Not because I don't love you, but because the the exponential love that she has for you is. 
I know it's um, kind of weird. I mean, it's kind of like I'm confused by it. I'm like, it's because she doesn't know me very well. That's what it is. The more she, no, to, that's to, not true. the more she it's gets because, to know me. No, it's because I know your heart, um, and in ways that you don't even probably acknowledge about yourself. Well, good, good. Then maybe you can. Uh, you can enlighten me. <laughs> it's like, well, I'm like, oh gosh, she knows my heart, and wow, that, that that's worse than I thought it was. All right, so, um, the, hey, I'm taking part in banter on the What God Is Not podcast. Oh, yeah. How yeah. exciting is that? Long time listener. Excited. Well, kind of. Yeah, apparently not. Well, Every you once in a while, listener. <laughs> me and <laughs> Father Michael are sometimes. both. I do, yeah. Me and Father Michael are both the the people that do podcasts, which I I, ha- I don't currently have a podcast, but I'm launching a new one. But I did one for a long time, and I don't really listen to podcasts. Yeah. So I listen no, to your same way. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, but I'm okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna start listening more. Let me. I'll say that more. I mean, you don't have to. There's no obligation. No. I want to. <laughs> you love uh-huh. me, so I need to listen. <laughs> Um, Father Michael. Yes, Mother Natalia. Why don't you? Oh, that sounds really nice. Oh, I believe. Why, I agree. Why don't you um, introduce Andrew Whaley, even though people have heard him mentioned many times? So this is Andrew Whaley, the voice you've been hearing. Um, I think I've known him as long, if not longer, than I've known Mother Natalia. When did we meet, Andrew Whaley? Oh man, it would have been. I moved to Denver in 2012, and we met oh. pretty shortly after that. Then I've known. Then I've known Mother Natalia for longer, but I don't. But um, but anyway, so I met Andrew Whaley because uh, he was running a coffee shop at the Augusta Institute, which many of you guys have maybe heard of. So Tole Leje is the coffee shop in the same building as Augusta Institute. I met him there. Then we started doing this thing. I don't even know how would, you probably remember this better than I do, Andrew Whaley, but, um, but the, uh, we started doing this thing where we'd meet for coffee on Friday mornings and we'd discuss like our dreams for how, how can we use coffee, which is Andrew's passion and just hospitality and community, which is both of our passion. And, um, how can we use that to to affect kind of the Catholic subculture and and evangelization in the world and getting Catholics to be more um, evangelistic and outward facing and missional and how can we use it to to draw in non Catholics especially the crazy ones that Andrew Whaley has a great affinity for um, and so do I and so uh, we began doing that and then we usually just became friends. Usually a jelly, and, and was it? And I remember the couple times at Aviano as well. I think oh, I think that was right, one yeah. of the yeah. one of the times I remember most was at Aviano in Denver, and then the jelly, which is a little cafe in Denver. Um, anyway, so we we've always just kind of been been friends about what what he loves, and I'm going to let him share all of that in a moment. Um, yeah, but uh, but he he is able to. Uh, Andrew has taken a lot of what others have said and reoriented it. Um, along with his own thought and vision and dreams uh, to be something that I think the church in this day and age needs to hear and, and, and what we need to do to be a more effective church when it comes to being attractive to people that are not currently in the church and also adapting ourselves to to see them as beloved and as desiring to welcome them into something that we see so beautiful. Um, so I, I'd, I'd actually, I'd, I guess, I guess we should just let Andrew Whaley explain, explain his vision. So Whaley, if you were going to give a, if you were going to give a three minute elevator pitch about, about what your apostleship is and your charism, what would that be? Can I ask a question I, first? Yeah, go ahead. Um, because I didn't realize, uh, I didn't realize how y'all met, like through the coffee shop at Augustine Institute. So, Andrew, did you know? Do you know John Irvin? Yeah, I'm good friends with John. Yeah. Oh, he was the first person who said that I was going to be a nun. Wow. Yeah. He. Nice um. It, we were we were at a focus conference. This was when I first came back to the church, and I was like crazy, and um, and. I was only, I think that this, this particular focus conference, this might've been the one that I went to just because it was like a free trip to Florida. I don't remember if that happened in Florida or Denver. <laughs> Anyways. 
<clears throat> but I had like no interest in the conference itself. I just went because it was a free trip, and then I had a big conversion. But anyways, the John Irvin, uh, he, you know, I'm like talking about this boy and that boy and whatever, and and he says to me, he was like, "You're so boy crazy. You're gonna be a nun." And I was so angry. I, I probably like didn't talk to him for two days or something because <laughs> uh, I was so I was so mad at the thought of it. But anyways, you were so shout crazy? out to John Irvin a little bit. Josh is. You know, and in fact, yeah, I had how, John. How is more <laughs> John uh, was I? Yeah, I interviewed John on my podcast one time. Oh, he's yeah, a good I man. I, 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 I would. Yeah, John and I had a, a constant like joking, digging at each other, kind of like kidding each other relationship. But I really love mm-hmm. that guy. I'm a fan. Mm-hmm. I haven't talked to him in a while, but um, yeah, that could be like your blog, like boycrazynut.com. <laughs> Yeah, I that might be kind of scandalous. So, well, I mean, it would cause questions, and then you could clarify, and then that would, now you're it's an icebreaker. Um, it has been fulfilled in her monastic life, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, there you go. Um, she has high standards for boys, so she just ended up. <laughs> um, so, I, so uh, three minute, three minute. Um, if I had, so if I had a three minute elevator pitch, I would hit the button to stop the elevator and make them listen to me for five to six minutes. Um, All right, let's do the five to six minute version then. I can't, I mean, well, I can't introduce myself in, in three minutes. I'll try. Um, no, I'm pretty good at this. I can do. So um, my name is Andrew Whaley. I am the founder of a project called Calyx, uh, that which is our, our colleagues, if you want to be correct in Latin, um, which means Ooh, or chalice Latin. in Latin. Just kidding. Yeah, I know I should change it to like Kylix or <laughs> something. Um, we need to figure out what the old Slavonic word for the cup is and then use that. Um, what, did, what did you say it's, it's Latin for? Cup. Or chalice. Like in the Latin mass, it would be like, hocus uh, inim calix sanguinis mei. This is all mm-hmm. the cup on my blood. Um, so it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it can mean cup in, and it's, it's actually it comes from the old from the Greek word um, kylix, I think, which was the cup they used, that big two-handled kind of ceremonial, like liturgical cup that they used in the symposium, which was basically a, a drinking party that started with liturgy, went through poetry and, and music, and ended up in like absolute debauchery, like as each cup came around. So somewhere between debauchery and liturgy, it's Calic, right there in the middle. Um, <laughs> there's the money quote for the podcast that they were all everybody could troll me on. Um, no, um, so I, I found this project called Calix, and we design, build, train, and launch uh, hospitality spaces, primarily cafes and coffee houses, as places of missional engagement between the Catholic world and primarily the deeply unchurched. Um, is kind of the vision. I don't get to build that as much. A lot of times we build a lot of uh, kind of internal community incubators where it's like Catholics wanting a place to hang out with Catholics and tell each other how Catholic they are. And I'm fine with that. That's good. But we we're, we're kind of barreling towards a demographic iceberg. And at some point we're going to have to invest in some knowledge and some, um, some structures to talk to non-Catholics because that's all we're going to have left. Just do the math. It's like, <laughs> so, um, so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to build, um, a, uh, an apostolate, a form, a structure, a set of best practices for evangelization in the post Christendom era. You know, and so in that's 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 basically it. Now, through that process of building uh, coffee houses and, and hospitality spaces, and coming up with the principles and the best practices and the underlying theory of this outward-facing evangelization, we have come up with other types of interfaces, other types of contexts that, that we kind of work on. But beyond that. We've kind of developed some best practices and some kind of insights and principles around the per se around the facing outward and around reaching the deeply unchurched. Sorry, yeah. we, we need to we need to let sis, mother tell her joke or she's not gonna or she's, she's not gonna be able to hold it here. together. Yeah. <laughs> I asked Father Michael before we were recording. Father Michael said something to me. He was talking about this mission, and, and she's like, "What? What is Andrew Lee going to talk about?" Yeah, and I and said uh, <laughs> this, this, and uh, outward-facing missional. 
And he said outward just, facing evangelization. And yeah. I was like, oh, is that like downward facing dog? And exactly. It is. Um, exactly. And that's all I can think of right now. Is what like, up, like, dog? You use okay. the word outward facing. I was like, she's got to get this out or she's just going to be giggling the entire time. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's all yoga. Basically, it's just yoga, up dog, down dog, sun salutation, whatever you got. We're, yeah, that's totally. No, that is not what we're doing. At so all. Well, welcome to the squirrels on our podcast, Whaley. That was a total cowboy. Oh, yeah, um, cowboy. And now we'll go back. Back, back uh, to your spiel. <laughs> dude, you know, you know more than anyone else in the world that I am pro level at squirrel distraction. I mean, it's like I have, I, I don't even have ADD. I have, I have ADOS, which is attention deficit. Ooh, squirrel. <laughs> so I don't let, me, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this, Rayleigh. Who, who, who is, who has complained the most about your squirrels? That's how we name our squirrels. It's whoever complains the most. Is there someone in your life that has ever complained the most? So like, uh, like Perla uh, Hoskins complains all the time about the distraction and then cowboy oh, yeah. kind of fake complains about it. So that's how Just we got so our that names. It could be named after him. Yeah. What do you want to name your squirrel? My squirrel is called everybody. That's his name. He's every squirrel. <laughs> um, I don't know. I'd have to think about it. I've kind of systematically removed ex girlfriend too. Yeah. <laughs> I've removed everyone from my life that's annoyed by it because, I mean, I literally read the report. Like when I was like four or five years old, I was in child development class. Like I was one of the little subjects that the high school kids were writing about. <laughs> and I got to do that when I was in high school and my teacher says, Hey, you want to see something cool? I'm like, yeah. And he hands me this piece of paper and it's the report that was written on little bitty me. <laughs> right. And it sounded like my performance review today. It sounded like every <laughs> single, I mean, I am, I talk, I talk too much. I use a lot of big words and, um, I am really hard to keep focus on anything. So I'm like, okay, four, I was four. So it's probably not going to happen. I saw, I saw a thing online the other day that said that it was a tweet or something. And the guy said that he's like, you know, I'm attention deficit disorder. You know, ADD has really affected my life. And so I thought, you know what, I should learn more about it. I should really understand it. So I did three solid hours of internet research about ADD. And what I found out is that the Canary Islands are named after a breed of dog, not the bird. <laughs> Where did you put the cameras? That is absolutely my life. You know, so but that, Andrew, yeah. um, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, well, that actually does feed into um, what Father Michael said that I kind of, I, one of the, ADD, I think, can be kind of a superpower in the sense that I think about a bunch of things at the same time that people wouldn't normally think about at the same time. And sometimes, mm -hmm patterns emerge and analogical kind of relationships emerge between these things. And I end up putting things together that no one would put together and then you create something new and that's innovation. So Calyx is kind of a mismatch of a bunch of influences of things that I was trying to think about that I kept thinking about the other things and then I identified patterns between them. So, I mean, I, in some ways ADD is my cross in some ways it's like I would fight you if you tried to take it from me because it's kind of my superpower at the same time. Nice. But yeah, we have so. a, we have a we have a phrase at the monastery of uh, mother says that certain certain struggles and stuff that each of the nuns has. She says that this is our cross and our crown. Mm. That's a great line. Yeah, I always yeah. say that the flip side of your greatest weaknesses is your greatest strength. Mm -hmm. You know, like two sides of one coin. You know, have you ever had those flip side pretzels? <laughs> those things are. So so good. They're this so is good. Real, real time squirrel, right? <laughs> was like the, I mean, I even noticed how squirrel that was. I mean, when I when Andrew Whaley is going, wow, that was super ADD. No, but and they're so good. Have you had them? All right, no, I'm, I'm as, as the least okay. ADD right now. I'm gonna I'm gonna channel Deacon Jonathan Dean and say, get back to the top. Okay, yeah, let's go back. Right. Let's go back. Go way back. Uh, okay, so we're gonna look. So Calix, as we're doing this, you know, so I tried to do some experiments around um, retail shops, just and I thought that maybe this could be just a way, kind of a spirituality of entrepreneurship, a way of being. Um, behind the counter, so to speak. And then it just, it, it became clear to me after two experiments in retail that it needed to be a more purposeful, probably nonprofit project. And so I ended up consulting in that first consulting gig. 
um, at the Augustine Institute because of construction delay and some stuff, I ended up launching this space instead of hiring a manager and training them. And that turned into me running uh, that coffee house. Uh, my, you know, Calix, my project contract managed that space for five years. And, but then while I was there, I started running around the country, helping other people build shops. And so we built a lot of beautiful shops, you know, we had Crux Coffee, or we designed Crux and helped launch Crux Coffee up at Wyoming Catholic, um, Shrine Coffee in Santa Cruz, California. Uh, we just, they just opened Core Coffee in the Newman Center at um, University of Illinois, Chicago. And I did work in a couple of great uh, Stargazer Fine Chocolates and Coffee in Denver as a family-based kind of like freestanding kind of project. So I've done I've done some different types of things. Some of them are a little like Toy Lege is a little more of an internal incubator. Things like uh, Crux are more of an interface between the community and this Catholic community at Wyoming Catholic. Um, those are the things that I really want people to build are things that are a little more connection to the community. But in that process we kind of accidentally hit on some principles and some best practices that have found a home outside of this kind of work, like specifically in campus ministry. I, I, I just spoke at um, St. Mary's at Texas A&M, and when they called me, I was like, I, I help people build things, and I tell them how to reach the deeply unchurched. You're not building anything, and you're one of the lost pockets of Christendom. What could I possibly say to you? Mm-hmm. But they they found all kinds of um, worthwhile insights from it. So so I'm kind of in that space where we we're going to both try to push both of these directions farther, and we're going to try to start really talking to the church about the bigger perspective of these ideas that we have and how to use that to face out work um, towards the deeply unchurched and de church. You're, she's, you're about to start laughing. I can see your face. Um, you're just saying you had this yoga joke. Um, and then the other side, we want to build a prototype, a freestanding prototype where we can really show what it looks like. If you would get deep, deep, deep in the community and slowly over time, organically build relationship and really earn the right to be heard, which, but now we're kind of getting over into the, the work of Calix. So, Yes. Can we, can, thank you. Perfect. And I would love, Andrew, if you could, if you could, um, oh my gosh, what did you just say? Uh, did, did you oh, oh sorry, first? sorry. The, those two things, the, the two things, Whaley, that you have said that have absolutely rocked my world and that, that I, that I think about every single day is, is those two things, earning the right to be heard. And then what the way you've adapted the, the alpha mindset of the process of belonging, belief, behavior. Can you describe what you mean by those two things um, to our listeners? That's the main reason why I wanted to sh- kind of share your what you are doing with the world. Those two things, earn the right to be heard, and then the process of belonging, belief, behavior. Okay, so earning the right to be heard. Um, it's funny. I I found out not too long ago that I think that I stole one of those Malfa, and I openly admit it. The, uh, this earning the right to be heard, I think that's the motto of young life, hmm. which I didn't know that. I think okay. they stole it from St. John Bosco or one of our saints. So, I mean, look, I mean, it's a great, good artist, steal, good artist borrow, great artist steal, you know, yeah. and it's truth is truth. But now I think that, look, there's, there's the, the, there's a precursor. There's a precursor to earning the right to be heard. There's two precursors. And that okay. is one of my presuppositions, and this is one of the things I teach people, is that in the same way that the sacraments are the ordinary means of grace, the ordinary context for evangelization or certainly any real discipleship is to be in relationship, in community with that person. Mm. If you're not willing to pay the price to be in relationship, in community with that person, then you don't get to be the one to evangelize them or disciple them. Hmm. You know, you can stand on a corner and hold a sign. And if that works for you, I'm not trying to trash talk anybody who's in the street evangelization. I've never really seen it work other than just like catching a few low hanging fruit that happens to be walking by. You know, Um, I think that the better thing to do would be to build a relationship over time. And then and then in that process that that's that's going to affect what you build and where you put it and all that stuff but then once you do that you have to earn the right to be heard and that means that you have to be i mean there was a time in the church maybe not too long ago where 
all you had to do is go, oh, well, the, the church teaches this, or I have a cassock on, and I, so you should listen to me. We're the conscience of the culture. But we're way on the long side of the sexual revolution at this point. We've had the sexual abuse scandal that just continues to just keep coming out and everything. We don't just automatically get everyone's respect. Mm-hmm. And culture has just shifted. So you kind of have to give them over time a reason to listen to you other than, well, I have some authority and I have the truth and you're wrong and I'm right. So you should listen. You have to, you have to earn that right over time. And that is through a lot of things, but through uh, a connection of shared in shared goods. We talk a lot about, we call them anchor goods Mm -hmm. where there are overlaps between the Catholic vision of reality and the, the, the vision of reality held by the person that you're trying to have relationship with. And a lot of those are going to come, are going to be very human goods, or maybe come from Catholic social doctrine or something. Um, and those, you, it might just be craft and beauty, and 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 just serving someone, being present, just listening to someone, giving them your full attention in this super distracted world, just sitting there and actually being present to someone, like they actually matter, mm-hmm. and all these little things. They're this combination of Mary and Martha, you know, you're Martha, 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 then you're Mary, then you're M- M- Martha again, you know, these moves of hospitality, these, this work of hospitality. If you're, it's a way of being Martha that is a Mary kind of mode. You're, you're, hmm. you're, 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 you're cooking, but you're actively facing and cooking for Christ in, in serving Christ and the stranger, hmm. you know? And when you do that, it awakens something in them. And, and it earns that. Now, ultimately, our goal would be to get beyond the shared goods of just like uh, worldview in the vision of reality and more towards being united by what Jazani would call these deep constitutive goods. These the, the answer to the deep constitutive needs that exist in each one of us. The true, the good, the beautiful, meaning, destiny, truth. I mean, uh, you know, um, reality, just this, these things that we're built for. Those are the things that earn the right to be heard. Now, the second thing that you you brought up was so the, the, the apostolate alpha. Which so sorry, real, real quick, real quick about the earning the right to be heard. My, my, my understanding of that is that, in other words, people are not going to listen to what you have to say until you have, until you have, um, relationship. Right. And, 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 but the relationship is like, they say, I actually want to hear what you have to say. I, 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 I have, I know that what you're sharing with me is done out of love and not out of coercion, not out of, you know, some sort of what the, what the, what St. Paul describes as, you know, um, I think it was with the, the Galatians, you know, that they, they boast of your circumcision and they, they boast of your circumcision because they're in a sense, they're, they're wanting to prove that we have con- like every every man that gets circumcised, we can say, okay, this is a notch on our belt. We 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 won another one over. Or it's the fear of persecution. And so there's this, you know, earning the right to be heard is say nobody's going to listen to us if they think we're just trying to get another butt in the pews. You know, no no, no, no one they're not going to listen to us if they think that we're just another notch in the belt. Oh look, I brought someone else in. So, but once we've said like. I love you and I love Christ. And so I'm going to, I want, I want you to be as happy and as fulfilled as I am because of my faith. And once they're convinced of that, and I, what I was going to bring up is that somebody actually, maybe it was even you, Whaley, or somebody said, this is what the banter is. I mean, there, there, there's certainly banter haters in any podcast, but sure, yeah. the banter is a, is uh, I'm going to, I'm going to be saying something, but, but you have to get to know me first. Like this is like um, Elizabeth Merze, who both of you know, like she's, she's her husband's from Afghanistan. She speaks fluent Farsi. When she went over to Afghanistan, she said, before any business gets done, you have to ask how your family is. You have to find out how that you have to say how you've been like the, the relationship 
it has to be built before any business gets done. The same thing we went down to Mexico, same thing. Like down in Mexico, you, 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 you establish that human relationship and the business does not matter. We're not doing this because of business. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I need the business, but my relationship is more important. So earning the right to be heard is kind of what people have said. The banter is the banter introduces us as individuals. People learn our personality. And then, then they would say, well, now I'll listen to what they have to say. Not because I'm searching for truth, which people should be searching for truth. And many people are, but because this is a truth that is coming from a place of great authenticity, and this is very dear to them. One of those lines, I think I've shared on the podcast before, but I love the the line at the very beginning of um, of Blue Light Jazz by, um, who wrote Blue Light Jazz? Whaley, do you remember? Uh, Donald Miller. Thank you, Donald Miller. So he has that line, and it says something like, he's more eloquent than this, but I never liked jazz. One day I was walking down the street, and there was a guy playing the saxophone. He played for 10 minutes and never opened his eyes. Now I love jazz. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, wait, when, yeah. cause he was just saying like this guy, the jazz is worthy of love because I've saw this, I saw this man love it and it's worthy of love. So therefore I'm, I want to love jazz because I saw someone loving it and, and, and therefore it must be worthy of love. So one thing that the banter does, one thing that the earning the right to be heard does is it says we've built up enough of a relationship where you, you're going to say, I'm, I'm curious about Christ because this person has given their entire life for him. This person has given up so much or loves him so much that that, that wouldn't be attractive to me unless I, unless I was attracted to you and, and, I, and I, I wanted to engage with you. And now what makes you tick? What makes you give up so much? What makes you love so much? And then when, I, when we say, well, it's actually, it's actually Christ and, and, and salvation and heaven and love and self-gift um, to the poor, all these things. And they say, well, let, let me find out more about that. So anyway, um, the, 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 that's why I love the earn the right to be heard so much is because so often we'll get to this in a moment with the second thing you're about to explain Whaley, but, but so often, um, we just, we want to cry out the truth from the rooftops and almost beat people's head, beat people over the head with, with truth without understanding that, that it's not that they're not accepting truth, that they, 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 they're not in a place where they can even hear the truth, let alone then accept it. And that, that, that being in the place where they can hear it and will actually be responsive, will actually be open to listening to it. That's kind of the first step. Um, that's the earning the right to be heard part. There is, I have, I have a few comments on that. Uh, first of all, just so I don't forget it because it's the last thing you said. Um, I was kind of praying with that this morning because I've been praying ever since my, <laughs> you told me, Father Michael, before my life profession to pray with the gospel of St. John um, and then afterwards to pray with the prophet Isaiah. And uh, I'm still I'm still praying with John because I've been moving through it so slowly. But I, I just read the, yesterday morning, sorry, I read the, the part in John, 17? No, 17 is the priestly prayer. 18? 18? Is, is 18 the um, betrayal? Yeah. Okay. So in John 18, um, I was praying with the part where Peter cuts off the ear um, of one of the soldiers. And, um, and, well, a couple things that I noticed in that in that gospel passage. One is that Jesus's response is, uh, "Shall I, shall I refuse or not receive or something like that?" Um, the chalice that the Father is giving to, to me, right? Um, and one of the things that I found interesting was John's gospel account does not have Jesus praying, "Let this cup pass." Um, let this calyx pass, if you will. Uh, John, John's gospel doesn't have that. The other three have that, or maybe two of the other three. Mm. And so it's interesting that, that John doesn't even have the part where he's, it has Christ's prayer of let this pass for me, but he does say to Peter, um, should I refuse this chalice? And, but the other thing is I was realizing like one of, one of the, the um, messages there for me was, that though, though we're called to defend Jesus, i.e. the truth, though we're called to defend the truth, it's not always at the time or in the way that we want it to be. Mm -hmm. and, and I thought of how many times I have with such zeal, quote unquote, defended the truth, defended Jesus um, by cutting off an ear 
and and doing so much more harm than good and and not allowing it to be what the Lord actually wants it to be, which is what I think you're saying. But but I so so anyways, I just was um, I was praying with that yesterday with that gospel. Amen. But uh, the you other know, cut, thing, cut, 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 cutting off his ear was kind of a, a lobe blow. <laughs> that was funny. Andrew knows I like these puns a lot. So, so um, the the other thing is <laughs> that's really funny. The other thing is that I I think that what this comes down to this this earning the right to be heard is something that all societies have like for all times. Um, in some sense you've needed, but I think part of the reason it's so true today is because we all have this, this gap in our life of being seen. We, we feel like we're not seen. And so someone wants, wants to feel like we have this deep ache to really be seen and to be loved. Um, and It's like, you, you know, everyone knows the person, Father Michael's like this. Um, my friend, Father Boniface is like this, the, the person who you're at a party with a bunch of people and they love all the people, but when they're in a conversation with you, like you're the only person in the world who matters right now. I experienced that with Father Boniface at your profession. Hmm. Really? Yeah. Outside. that's yeah. I mean, that's, I had that that's exact how he is. experience. He knew everyone there. Everyone was claiming for his attention, and I was his universe for a few minutes while we were talking. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And and like that seeing earns the right to be heard because it's like it's 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 almost like you know that this person. Um, anyways, I don't. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna beat that down. But um, I'll, but I'll, I I'll, think. I'll, 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 go ahead. Sorry. I, I think though, Andrew, in all seriousness, this I'm, I'm not playing around here. I think this is what I was trying to articulate when you were like, I don't even understand why Mother Natalia loves me. Um, it's like, I, I see exactly what you were talking about of the good, the true and the beautiful in your heart. And, and, uh-huh. and those things are there even if you don't see them or if you don't acknowledge them because you're made in the image of God. Uh, and... And as you increase in virtue, you, you grow in the likeness. But um, I don't know. I just, when we see others and we're really trying to see them, we love them more and people feel that love and they know that we're speaking from a place of love uh, because it's genuine. And, and like people know when they're trying, when they're like, you're trying to trick them or something. That's, and I think that's it is what it comes down to is, man, there's so much I could say about this. Um, we, we don't want to be used, you know, and it's real quick to, to get our um, things that, you know, whether if you're a woman and you're being used for pleasure or you're a, a someone who's being used for profit or something, there's an immediate, um, immediate reaction to it's, it's an affront to our dignity. But I think that there's a subtle, there's a subtle use that has developed in the mode of evangelization in the church where it's become kind of the imposition and the assertion of ideology that is kind of, and I think this is a by, this is one of the two or three bad byproducts of apologetics culture in the eighties, nineties and early two thousands is that people are being reduced to at worst they're being reduced to a placeholder of a position in a cult, in the culture war, or in a certain ideological battle, or they're being um, re- reduced to a, maybe a project, like Father Michael was saying, another potential butt in the seat, another you know another notch on my my belt. God's so proud of me, I got another one. You know, it's like, and I think that the the way that you have to kind of counteract that is, you know, Christ said that as the Father sent me, so I send you. And you go, well, how did the Father send the Son? Well, St. Paul tells us, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so when we allow ourselves to love people, not 
And I just want to love them because I'm on team Christ and I want to take you over to Christ and introduce you to him so I can pawn you off on Jesus, put you on the same team. Now we agree. You see that I was right and I can go off and get another one while you're over there. But loving someone with the love of Christ will make you long for relationship with them. Mm-hmm. And that is a very natural way to be drawn in. And I think that people, people instinctively, that maybe pe- even people who are kind of thrown off by the idea of the incarnation, they want to see, they want to see truth, good, the true, the good, and the beautiful incarnated. They want to see it made human. And when you are being that for them, and you're not using them, you're designing a relationship for them, then. You are making that present in the same mode, in the same way that God made that present in the incarnation. Mm -hmm. And even if they might ideologically reject the concept of the incarnation, their heart longs for that, that interface with truth through the human, through, Mm -hmm. through, through their, through their real, through real relationship with, with the incarnate. And so I think that that, that's part of it. I think people are just tired of being argued with and, 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 and try people trying to win a battle or something. And so the way you get around that is you just actually have to care. You have to actually give a dang about these people. You have to actually want relationship yeah. with them. And um, mm-hmm. now then that, I guess I'll, I'll move on to the, to the second, the second thing the father asked me to talk about um, in the apostolate um, in the ministry uh, alpha, which started as a Protestant project, but now they have a, um, uh, they're used quite a bit in the Catholic world. I was talking to, I can't remember his name. I apologize. I should have looked this up before the podcast. Um, the, the, the director, the national director for alpha in a Catholic context, really great guy, really great conversation. I can't remember his name. Um, I'll have to look it up. It's been months ago. My, ever since taking care of my mom for a few years, it's just like my brain, my, my memory doesn't work the way it used to after all that stuff with my mom, but that's a side story. Um, and so, um, he told, he gave me the greatest gift. And I said, I'm going to steal this and I'm going to attribute it every time I use it though. (laughs) And that is, he said that in alpha, they want people to belong, believe and behave in that order. Hmm. And it's the exact opposite of what we do as Catholics in the modern world. We're involved in this ideological battle and we're just like, look, I don't care what you believe. And I don't want relationship with you. Just don't, don't get an abortion. Just don't and stop being gay. Stop doing this. Just change your change your behavior. Now, if you change your behavior because you heard the correct man, you're like Jesus is Lord, and oh, maybe you even became a Catholic. Okay, that's that's great. I like that better. But really, what I wanted you was to to act different. It's an ethical project. And then in the end, it's like okay, you won. I got you. Got you. Got the behave and I really even believe now. So is there something I could belong to? And I don't know, you can go to mass. I mean, there's Knights of Columbus are going to make some pancakes this weekend. I mean, there's like, there's nothing to belong to, right? There's no community. So then the opposite of that with the concept of alpha and the belong, the reversing that procedure is saying that, no, you have to build something for them to belong to. So while they're still, they don't believe Jesus is Lord, They maybe don't even believe in God and they're still living with their girlfriend and they're still doing whatever you think they need to stop doing that. You need to build something that they say, no, that's my place. That's my home. Those are my people. Now, how in the world they do that with alpha? I don't understand because I mean, a bunch of blatantly religious videos and questions you're going to kind of, we're going to filter out a lot of people that aren't willing to go there. So I, I kind of go back way farther than that. People that would never come to something like Alpha, you know, um, uh, people that would never walk into a church for the most part is what we're trying. Those are the people we're building for. So then you have to build. So then the question is, well, what in the world can you build that someone who doesn't believe and is not behaving is going to come to five days a week and feel at home and loved it? That's what we do. Hmm. Coffee. I mean, there's there's a few things you could do, but I mean, there is a, a a community form in Western civilization where people come to it every day. They spend time with people that are very, very different from them and have even deep conversation with people that are very different from them. And that's normal for that community form. 
So you're not going to have that conversation in the produce aisle, but you will have it at your local shop. Yeah. So we coffee just shop. do that. Yeah. Your local coffee shop. Yeah. yeah. So, so just to reiterate, sorry, go ahead, sister, mother. No. I was going to say, so to reiterate the, the, especially I think for our contemporary, for the contemporary Western American in this case, um, what you you have it? They're, they're going to be. It's just like you know, Chris Stefanik so eloquent about the three transcendentals: truth, beauty, and goodness. Where the the like nobody in this generation and for the past three generations has cared about truth or goodness. Both of those are completely subjective. There's no objectivity. But but this generation does respect beauty in a way that. It doesn't respect the other two in general, the secular, secular generation. So in other words, so let's focus on beauty. And once they have beauty and once they understand beauty for what it truly is, because that's one thing that is going to get your foot in the door, then they may actually seek out, if they believe in objective beauty, they may then seek out objective goodness and objective truth. And then these things that are so uh, real when it comes to faith in the transcendent. But with this, it's like the, the people don't have faith and they certainly don't behave according to the faith. So, but what they do desire Desire, especially post COVID, is community, is this belonging. So, so if they if if they first belong, and you say, you know, you're gonna be you're gonna be so different than other people here, but we don't want you like come and belong. And then from belonging, they're gonna say they're gonna see some thread among the belonging that 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 then hopefully they the holy the Holy Spirit guides them to the next step, which is belief. Then they believe, and then once they believe, that affects their behavior. So you can't expect. Be- change behavior in the beginning you 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 have a place of belonging that leads to the holy spirit seems to be leading that from belonging to belief and then to behavior and it has to happen like you said whaley in that order absolutely and then i have uh, one, yes. one more question for you okay. but i want a mother to, I, I want i want to i want to riff on that real fast sure at the risk of giving any any kind of props to chris Stefanik, you know Hmm. You know, I just can't stand that guy. You know, me and Chris <laughs> just don't get along at all. But. He's kidding their friends. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and Barron says the same thing, Bishop mm-hmm. Barron, that the, the, the beauty is the spearhead of the new evangelization. And it's funny. It's the, it, the same way that that belong, believe, behave is the reverse of what we normally do in the Catholic world. If that's also the reverse, right? Because it's like we will leave blood on the field for the objective nature of the true and the good. Yeah. But then it's like, well, you know, it's like we don't we wouldn't know the beautiful if it came up and bit us. And we put up with so much ugliness in our churches and the way that we do things and the way that we design the way we are everything about the church. We 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 really are okay with that now. And it's interesting that the modern world, I think, in relation to beauty, I think that the modern world has been numbed to, to the ugly. You know, we're harder to shock and we will take a, a level of ugly that we wouldn't take before. But we haven't been completely inoculated against the beautiful. Hmm. We, right. it's, it's, it's still um, every pagan that you know that says that they would hate the true and the good or whatever, uh, as we define them, when they go to Rome, they go to St. Peter's. Why? It's beautiful. Hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, so I think that, but now, now then you say, okay, take that concept of the beautiful even you and, and double down you go look at like culinary beauty or design i think design is to the moderns what rhetoric was to the ancients you have to have good design mm. you know and then just craft everybody loves craft now craft and art artisan work and everything is that form of the beautiful has has become huge and then even just look at the the way you live the way you carry yourself the way you listen to them the way you serve them the way you're the way you do everything you can act beautifully the way the greeks would say that there was a beautiful death or something or he, he died a beautiful death beautiful can be applied the, the in different ways and i think that i think as catholics you hear a lot of people griping about the beautiful and it's really just an excuse to make fun of bad churches and then redecorate churches to make them look more like pre-Vatican II. Which I'm, um, okay, great. I like those churches and I think that we do have ugly churches and I like the older churches better. But that's kind of like you're getting you're getting out of it with an easy answer if you think it's only architectural and it's yeah. only pretty paintings and statues. And on the other side, I think this, even, even as I describe belonging 
and beauty. Like these are these are two things that that the church has been trying for 60, 70 years, but they I think we have not done a good job of it. In other words, we've been emphasizing the community aspect of the body of Christ over the Eucharistic aspect of the body of Christ. Now that's wrong. Like that they're equal, but when you when you move the tabernacles in the, in the Roman Catholic Church, you move the tabernacles from the central part of the church, you move it to somewhere else to emphasize the community rather than the Eucharist. Like you're that's that's not helpful. And so when we say you, you can, we have to make sure that we're not stopping at belonging. Belonging like you're you're going to trust the Holy Spirit, but you need to provide the truth of belief before they're going to move on to the goodness of of, of behavior. So mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. so you cannot stop there. There, there needs to be an openness to promoting really what, what belief and, and behavior is that you cannot water that down. I think what the church has done for the past 60 years is we emphasized beauty and we emphasized belonging to the detriment of the other ones. For sure, and then for so, sure. and we watered them down and said, Oh, you don't need those. You don't need to believe that it's really the body of Christ. You don't really, you know, need, need to, to behave according to the truth of the gospel and the truth of what the church teaches. So there has to be an authenticity to all three levels, but while at the same time acknowledging that the authenticity of the second two are not going to even be respected until the authenticity of the first one without taking away the other two is, is actually lived out. Yeah. And then I have mother, uh, We need to let mother talk. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, mother. No, it's okay. I, uh, there, well, there are a few things I'm thinking now of just how I think that there's a certain power to, to a coffee shop in particular of, I I remember I was a barista in college and, uh, and I, I just could see in people's faces what a difference it made made when they would come in and, and I'd greet them by name or I'd start their order sure. before they, before they placed it because Absolutely. I just knew what they wanted and everything, you know? And so it's like coffee shops in particular have, have this atmosphere in which it can so easily become a place of belonging. And so I think that there's, there's something good there of, it also makes me think of the cheers, um, yeah, for sure. The Cheers intro song, you know, the yeah. sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. Right. Norm, the, right? Norm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but the other thing, have I ever told you about the coffee shop in Cuba, Andrew? No, no, you haven't. So when I lived in Guantanamo Bay, there was a coffee shop um, at the church and it was called wait, the wait, Guana Coffee. You lived in Guantanamo Bay? Yeah. I didn't know. Uh, yeah, for two years. So um, what did so you when do? I was in um, mostly waterboarding. Gu- I'm just you got put, you got put in Guantanamo. Oh, I thought you were you were in Guantanamo. I thought that you are subversive. Um, wow. So, so the uh, yeah, that was not a funny joke. I regret. I regret that. Well, but it was more Actually, like with it was more like pour over coffee. But you were pouring coffee on. You were pouring water on something. It was just coffee grounds. You know, it was so, kind of like. <laughs> so I was in sixth and seventh grade at the time. So I was, um, I don't know, like 12 or something. But uh, so there was this coffee shop uh, called Iguana Crossings and it was at the church. It was owned by the church uh, for, for a while. My dad managed it. But this coffee shop, it was really neat because uh, all of the drinks were free. Hmm. But in order in order to pay for it, people would the rate the regulars would when they came in to get their drink every once in a while, they would be they would bring a bag of coffee beans or they'd bring a jug of half and half or they would. And that's how that's how everything was supplied. And we never had to charge for the drinks. And and that was just this beautiful. It added this like communal sense to um, this is my coffee shop, you know, and Hmm. my dad let me my dad let me work there. sometimes and so I would take like a two-hour shift or something like that uh and and I remember there was this group of of people who would come in and they were probably I don't know they were probably like in their 50s uh but it's hard to know because I was 11 and so you can't really judge age at that time in your life but yeah um and they would play cranium every Monday night, I think. And it was like the greatest gift in the world when my dad would let me go in and work that shift and then stay to play cranium with them. And, <laughs> and I, think, I think that they weren't even all Catholic. Um, there were like three or four of them. And they, I think they weren't even all Catholic. But this was this place in which, in which they met um, for specifically for community. And yeah, so. Yeah, I think that, I mean, that's the thing is that the reason you have the reason the church made the mistake of like 
moving the tabernacle and then, you know, messing with the mass and doing all kinds of crazy stuff with the mass and everything. It's because when you, all you have is the mass and you want to do something else, then you end up turning the mass into this big Super Bowl party. But it's, you have, it, how about we leave the mass intact? We, leave we the have a Super Bowl party. <laughs> yeah, we actually leave the tabernacle where it's at and we build something other than a church where we can actually have a party. Right? And we have a party every day. We bring people in, you feed them, you give them something to drink, you know, you do these normal human goods, you know. And that goes to say that it's like, if you're going to build this and you're going to build something that Catholics are not going to, that, that not only Catholics are going to come to, then you have to build it in a way and you have to brand it in a way, you have to name it in a way that that is is ergonomic to the people that you're trying to have relationship with you know and so you know if you call it immaculate and serve a popacino and give a free scott Hahn book and a rosary with every latte then you're, you're going to get people once i have to stop using that joke because someone tried to call something immaculate i'm like no no that's bad <laughs> don't use that name that's the, that's the icon of what not to do stop well it's so fun right it's fun for catholics if you watch a bunch of ewtn then you're gonna love that name but you're not trying to reach people that watch that's a bunch right. of ewtn yeah. you know you're trying to reach people that are wouldn't know what ewtn is you know you're trying not trying to you create that that space full of your people like you you're trying to get outside of that so i think that that's um but i think yeah this that normal the normal activity of the cafe i mean the four things that mark the cafe are con- the consumption of food and beverage conversation reading and writing those things and then things like gameplay and stuff like that have, have, have been a part of it and, and, and different aspects, but just just spending time together, doing things together, conversation, just maybe reading a book, writing in the corner, just uh, that those normal, very human things are the moves of, of, of the community inside of a space like that. Father, uh, you had another question. I did. Um, I I would love for, in, and let me just, I'll, I'll lead into this, so this is kind of my reflection, but... Um, when I was when I was a, in a priest, probably six seven years. Um, shout out to Tom Hewley. Uh, this businessman in Denver approached me and said, "Hey, I'm putting together a cohort for this priestly leadership program called Good Leaders, Good Shepherds, and it's a four year program, and it, it's it's a it's kind of leadership legacies for priests, and so there's it's leadership training for priests, and so I went through this, and God bless Tom, he had kind of handpicked." probably seven or eight of us priests that he knew that he wanted to be in his cohort to do this four-year program. And it was absolutely incredible. I mean, it was, it, it, I, I wish I had adopted more. I still have all the resources, but it was, it, it really did give me hope for, for here's how you can use kind of common sense, tried and tested leadership um, models for business that can also work in, within the church adapted towards, you know, the, the body of Christ and, uh, and, and the parish model. And I, I, so after going through this, I said, you know, why don't, why don't you teach this in seminary? Like this, this should be a course in seminary. And he said, oh, we tried, but the semin, no, none of the seminarians listened. In other words, it, it, they all, when, when you prevented them, presented them with an idea of said, Hey, look, you're going to have, you're going to have people in the parish that are looking for this practical thing. And they're looking for this spiritual thing. And they're looking for this and all the seminarians just, it, it's kind of essence. And I remember this when I was a seminary, you, you think that you're going to be better at this than you are going to be. You, you think it's going to be easier than you, and you think that you think that there's the solutions to the issues in, in parish life are just kind of, you know, pray harder and, and, and like love the way you love, like, Oh, people are going to respond to the way I love. That's not always the case. So, but he said, in other words, they, the, the seminarians have not lived the life of a pastor yet. So it needs to be offered to priests like five years after they've been in the ministry, because then they're going to be like, I need something else. Like this mm-hmm. isn't as easy. And, and then the same thing happens with like ECF and CCD. Like when we educate children, like they're bored out of their minds a lot of the times in these classes because we're, we're kind of throwing church teaching at them without them even asking what church teaching is or so we need to kind of go back and find out. So the, the, the other phrase, I don't know where you got this from Andrew, but, but don't answer any unasked questions. In other words, if people come to you, don't start throwing answers to the questions they haven't 
unasked. They're, they're not going to listen. They're going to be bored out of their minds. So, so can you explain where you got that from and, and how you see in the context of these outward facing hospitality centers, like, like how, how do they, how do we approach that idea? You know, yeah, don't okay. answer any unasked questions. Um, so there's a precur- there's a there's a precursor concept to that, that and they're both kind of from the same place. Um, the 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 the, the, per, the prohibit the prohibiting of answering unasked questions is from a quote by a uh, Reinhold Niebuhr that says something along the lines of um, "There's nothing more shocking than an answer to an unasked question." But I got that because the uh, Masia Gizani, Luigi Gizani, used to quote that all the time, um, hmm. and so the. The, the precursor concept of that is um, kind of the heartbeat. In some ways, here's what you're doing. Here's the kind of place you need to build to be able to do this. But here, here is really what you're doing. And that is the awakening of desire. And what do I mean by that? You know, um, and this is like all blatantly stolen from Father Julian Caron in the first chapter of a book called Disarming Beauty. Everyone should read it. And, um, Corona says basically like, look, you, you meet someone and they have insufficient or incomplete answers, right? They're wrong. They're, they're a materialist. Let's say they think there's nothing but atoms in the space in between them. So we as Catholics say, oh, that guy needs some information. Let's get him some information. And like the bar and the blues brothers that had both kinds of music, country and Western, we have, um, <laughs> we have both kinds of information in the church, catechesis and apologetics. So it's like, okay, we got to get this guy some catechesis and some apologetics, right? And Caron says, no. No, he says that reality, the fullness of reality, even the infinite, gives itself freely when questioned correctly. The reason this guy has insufficient or incomplete answers is because he's asking insufficient or incomplete questions of reality. And then he says, well, you know, why, uh, why is he doing that? Well, he says it's because his desire has not been awakened yet. And he says, well, then the obvious question is, well, how do you get your desire awakened? Um, he says the same thing that Plato said about the good. You got to get around someone whose desire has been awakened. Mm. Yeah. And so that's what I do is build a context for repeat ga- engagement where we on the on the far side of the counter can kind of go about this process of the recovery of our own hearts, so to speak, to try to, to try to awaken our own desire and maybe live with an awakened desire. And in a way that that will rub off in people, all the things that people have kind of dialed their desire down to what they know, hmm. or if they can't dial it down, they numb it with, booze or Facebook doom scrolling or porn or busy or whatever you can get your hands on to numb that, that desire for this thing that you don't know what it is. Cause you've written off community, you've written off Christianity, you've written off religion, but yet somehow your heart is hungry for something more than you have access for. And you can either dial that down or you can numb it mm-hmm. or you can let it hurt and wake up one of the two. Um, and then so then we, we go about that, and, and, and then I think that being present to Christ and the stranger in the Benedictine mode of, care, of hospitality is a, is a unique way to really, really awaken yourself by serving Christ, being in that Mary mode while you're being Martha. And then the other side is the flip side is loving them with the love of Christ, you know, instead of seeing them as a project letting Christ longing for them be present in you. So you're kind of Christ loving Christ in that mm-hmm. moment. And uh, I, I've noticed that a, a place opens up between you and I'm not talking about apologetics without words, a place opens between the guest and the person serving in that mode that does two things that the Holy spirit can inhabit. And it does two things that it, it helps you recover your own heart and awaken your heart and it rubs off and it awakens their desire as well. Now, where did, how does that have to do with the question you asked me about unasked questions? When that, I had to say all that to, to give this answer. So when that desire, when that holy discontent, when that, you know, C.S. Lewis talks about, you see 
some beautiful sunset or hear a great, beautiful piece of music or hear some beautiful, really true lecture or read a book or something or see a beautiful human being. And then it's just this mountaintop experience and you're, there's always a letdown afterwards hmm. because it's the beautiful you want. It's not something beautiful. It's, something, it's not something that participates in the beautiful. It's the beautiful you want, right? So when living that life in community, recovering your own heart, living and living with an awakened desire in the context where you're anchored by these shared goods, you're increasingly being anchored by these deeper, more constitutive goods. At some point, that, that longing, that, 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 dis, that holy discontent will come to the point of a question, and then you just answer it. Mm. But the desire is the hermeneutic. It is the interpretive key to understand mm. the answer. So yeah. telling them the answer before they ask the question is like me walking up to someone in Cuba and telling them the answer in Hungarian. They don't speak that language. And it's kind of like throwing pearls before swine. In other words, this yeah. is something beautiful and sacred, but but you're not able until you ask, until you, until you even want what we're offering here, you're going to, you're not going to appreciate it for the beauty that it is. So it's, it's mm-hmm. almost like a protective thing by not throwing truths to people that don't seem ready to accept the truth. You're, you're, the you're doors, actually protecting the doors. them. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. We, 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 we kick out those who are un, uninitiated for their own sake, mm-hmm. not, not for our protective nature, but we're saying we're, we're about to show you Jesus Christ himself, but it looks like bread. And so you're going to be scandalized by this. If you, if you view right. it, because you haven't been baptized, you're not able to see it for what it is yet. It's very protective. We're protecting you, even though they don't understand it that way, of course. But yeah, you know, your um, all this talk about desire, Andrew, reminds me of my my favorite quote by Saint Augustine: "Is he who is lost in his passions is less lost than he who has lost his passion." I love that quote. And yeah, it's so good. And um, he who is lost in his passions is less lost than he who has lost his passion, mm. because at least the one lost in their passions has the desire, has has that um, that unknown God <laughs> that uh, that they're worshiping and uh, and the, the beauty that they're desiring. But it also reminds me of I, I had shared a poem back when we did the the episode on transfiguration. I had shared a poem. It was the first poem that I'd written at least as an adult. Oh, and, I was there. Um, I was there when you shared. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and there was this moment when like it, it, it's, the poem is all about my experience of Christ on the mountain of, um, on Mount Tabor, uh, at the transfiguration. And, and there's this line that's, um, uh, and so I leave the mountain. Oh gosh. I don't know how my own poem goes, but I said, um, I said, but the mountain is not my love. My love is you. Mm. And um, because there is this moment that we have to get to where we acknowledge that it is it is the beautiful, not the thing that is beautiful that you're talking about. And mm. we have to um, we have to get to that point where we make that transition, because then we realize that we can have the beautiful, the beauty everywhere when we can have that intimacy with the Lord and have the beauty of relationship with him wherever we are. Right. We're, I mean, we're, we're, that's the thing is that we're not. We're not meant to be decoration. We're meant to be icons, you know, mm-hmm. or windows. You know, someone mm-hmm. asked me, um, we were talking about decorating a space and they were wanting to put a lot of pictures of saints on the wall or whatever. And I said, I don't want my saints on the wall. I want them behind the counter. Mm-hmm. I, want, I want the human reasons to believe the windows, the human windows into the divine wiping that spill and, and pouring latte art and, and ask, remembering your drink when you walk in. I want you to interact with them. And so I think that that but but you have to keep in mind, it's not about us mm-hmm. because I'm longing for you with the long love of Christ. It still doesn't mean it's about relationship with me. I'm there to be a window. I'm there for you to over time from to participate in this thing greater than both of us so that through my humanity, through the incar- through it, that thing can be incarnated and made present and available in a way that you can understand it. I mean, that's the that's what it comes. That's what all this comes down to is that that Aquinas says, uh, you know, loving love is willing the good of the other as other, right? And while we were sinners, Christ died for us. You know, we know that from Motiwa that 
that love is a gift of self. Love is laying down your life. But another Aquinas quote that I quote a lot is, um, and this is, this is, I start twitching from having, having gone to Thomas Aquinas College. I twitch every time I say this because it's, uh, cause it hurts. <laughs> but, but it's the thing received is received in the mode of the receiver. The, the, the gift is received in the mode of the person getting the gift, right? Mm-hmm. Or the scripture says that um, a loud blessing early in the morning is taken as a curse, right? So your job is to create a place where you can lay your life down, but lay your life down in a way that they will experience it as love. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so you're like, oh, I want to lay my life down by doing a bunch of apologetics or dragging you in a liturgy when you're not ready for it or mm-hmm. arguing you arguing with you about, you know, who your roommate is or whatever, how you're living your life or what substances you're putting in your body or whatever. No, you have to you have to earn your right. You have to earn those conversations to accept, but you earn it by laying your life down for them in a way that they can understand that. All I do is build a room where that can happen. And. That that's that that's, that's in some ways that's the entire ministry that's the entire project that I do. Amen. All right, um, let's go ahead and finish up with uh, some prayer intentions. Very good to have you on, Andrew Whaley. Uh, thank can I get, you for can sharing. I, can I get my Can I get my website or you know yeah go ahead. Or anything? Yeah, so yeah calix dot org c a l i x dot org. Um, email addresses, phones, everything is on there. Um, if you are interested in this kind of thing, you want to know more, you want to talk to me, you want you got questions for me or whatever, hit me up. I would love to help out. So perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I highly recommend if this touched your heart to be in touch with him um, so that you can uh, learn more and, and possibly, you know, actually execute something that, that is on your heart. Uh, thank you. Thank you again, Andrew, really for coming on. I appreciate it um, for accepting the invitation and for, uh, yeah, for being yourself and for being so receptive to what our Lord is doing in all these ways, you know, up to this point in your life. So thank you for that. Um, all right. Uh, prayer intentions. Uh, I was just thinking like who I wanted to pray for as we close out. I think, you know how people when they're in college at Steubenville, how they pray for their future spouse, um, you know, because they, they you know, th- that they exist, they're alive, they're about their same age, most likely, even though they don't know they who do they that? are. And they, Father oh, Michael, yeah, you've already promised celibacy. I know, the, so that's where I'm going with this. But I'm, <laughs> yeah, but both I'm of asking, you have, you're going to pray for my spouse, good, because yeah. <laughs> she's lost, because I can't find her. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> calyx.org you can find his email there single ladies yeah exactly yeah. the live forms to the left ladies thank god this is an audio podcast and not a video podcast. he's a catch all right Father um, Michael what's your actual intention is to pray for my future bishop um, mm. so oh, right good. now yeah. Bishop John retired and um, we have a wonderful administrator uh uh, Bishop Olmstead of Phoenix, of Roman Phoenix, but and he's wonderful. He's he's done so much for our eparchy. But um, but so yeah, pray for whoever the whoever we get as our next bishop for the eparchy of Phoenix, um, that they may be uh, maybe you know good, holy, prayerful, a good leader, and and kind of open to like wise about what our eparchy and our parishes need. But also, I really hope that that our bishop in the context of this conversation is is, is open to. Um, this an understanding that 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 going out to the unchurched and going out to those who would ordinarily not in any way be attracted to our ancient form of spirituality um, would be you know empowering in, in encouraging and um, allowing us to to focus on this moving forward. So that prayer would be great. Um, you know what's really interesting is I had thought of my prayer intention before you gave yours, but my prayer intention is for the eparchy of Parma, <laughs> ah. uh, because uh, we're just um, yeah, the eparchy's like there's lots of pains and lots of struggles, but I also think lots of hope and mm. um, and our monastery being one of those places of hope. And so, please pray for our eparchy as we're um, yeah learning uh learning how to trust and how to hope Amen. at Barkey of phoenix uh parma sorry both, <laughs> both. <laughs> my home at Barkey is phoenix but now i'm in parma all right and Whaley. um uh i want to uh a couple prayer intentions one is just a prayer in gratitude 
for um, the privilege and the overwhelming beauty of being able to take part in Mother Natalia's life profession Mm -hmm. and all other relationships that I started there and deepened there and all the people this ever I want to pray for everyone who was how to say it I the way I experienced this was um, the planting of a seed and kind of the deepening of something inside me by taking part in that. And as I've talked to other people that were friends that were there, they experienced the same thing. And so I'm just praying miracle grow on that uh, seed (laughs) that was planted in me and in everyone and in gratitude for the beauty of um, your life and getting to take part in that. And um, I'm also going to be selfish and say, I'm asking for prayer for myself um, I'm, I'm now back out in the world after, you know, COVID isolation and two and a half years of being a caregiver for my mom. Calix got put semi on hold a lot during that time. And, um, I've got to really pull the trigger on some definite plans and ideas. And I'm at a fork in the road on a lot of things, both personally and professionally right now. And I really, um, I really need discernment and I really need clarity from our Lord on a few things, both personally and professionally. So I'm going to ask for, I'm going to ask prayer for myself. So amen. There you go. Um, I forgot that I need to give a very quick thank you also to Ryan Taylor, who um, sent me a package of liquid IV for as a life profession gift. And, um, I also got cards from other listeners that I'll respond to eventually. Um, but I have lots of thank yous to send. So please be patient. Uh, but Ryan, I wanted you to know that other than a, something that the community ordered on Amazon at one point, your package is the first that I got addressed to mother Natalia. And so that nice. Was very cool. Oh, nice. Yeah. Cool. And I'm, I'm before I give a blessing here at the end, I just want to, I want to say, and I don't know if there's, I mean, I know that three names that popped up while you were talking, Andrew, about kind of engaging with people that have had their desire awakened and, and being around them makes, makes that desire increase in us. Um, I want to say like the, probably the one of the name that, that comes up most often in my life for the past 15 years, um, as someone who everybody who engages with them emerges wanting to be better and wanting to, to learn more about truth, beauty and goodness is father Nick Blaha. And, and, you know, he, he, he has influenced so many. I mean, I would say that if you'd ask me, give me the short list, give me your short list. Blaha would be on my list too. I mean, I mean, I'm literally saying that exact thing at a talk for him on my website. It's like, I, I just acknowledge it. I agree hundred percent. So for listeners of Catholic stuff, my old podcast, like you, this is, this is who influenced father Nathan Goebel immensely. Um, and so anyway, father Nick Blaha, I'm sure you can find him on some social media. The other one, the other two that came popped up were father Damien Ferentz, who I introduced you to Aww. Andrew Whaley and who, oh, and we who were just mother like, Natalia knows. Finish each him. other's sentences at her, yeah. at your life profession banquet <laughs> afterwards. He introduced me to father. He, Ferentz he told me we, we were talking, Talking this last week, Father Damien and I, and um, and just the most beautiful, edifying conversation he and I have ever had. But he was like, I met some really great people. He was like, I met this guy who starts coffee shops um, from LA, and I was, hmm. he was like, I think his name was Andrew, and I was like, Andrew Whaley. <laughs> Anyways, I loved Father Ferentz. I mean, he is. He gave me he gave me one of the best profession gifts. He gave me a wax seal, which I've wanted for so long. Mm -hmm. Um, He got it in Rome. He got one for Mother Petra and one for myself in our favorite colors. And uh, anyways, I love him so much. And the other two I want to throw out there were just Father Joel Barstat, who you guys know from our podcast. He's Mm -hmm. also someone that you, you, you meet him once and you have a nice deep conversation and you come out wanting to be better, more of a Renaissance, you know, Christian Renaissance man. He just, he's so knowledgeable and so loving and he, he knows so much about literature and, and everything about the church and everything about just truth, beauty, and goodness. And then also um, Archbishop Chaput, who, who who is, is another one who I, every time I left spiritual direction with him, he's now retired Philadelphia 
obviously a retired official Philadelphia. Every time I left spiritual direction with him, I just, I wanted to be a better priest and a better man. And like mm. every single time. So anyway, real quick, I know we're going very long, but do you guys have anybody that comes to mind that you could say, here's someone that, that, it, that whenever you engage with them, I walk away wanting to be a better person. And I, I'll, I'll, I'm going to throw assistant mother Natalia into this as well. Um, I, I was kind of doing present company excluded, but I think all of you that are new, that are listening to our podcast, um, you know, this, the same thing, like the, the way that mother Natalia, um, engages with our, her relationship with Christ and her relationship with me and her relationship with those, all those she encounters there, you walk away from that, fe- of course, feeling loved, but also just wanting to be a better person and a better Christian, you know? So anyway, all of those, any, anybody else that you two mentioned and you can't, you, yeah, go ahead. Whoever you um, think. The first one that comes to mind is Father Boniface Hicks, who mm. we already talked about. Um, he just always makes me want, want to be a better person. Um, Father Matt Kortnick as well, who you've met Father Michael, um, but he's one of the most just like humble, pure of heart men that I've ever known. Uh, Maggie Zabegan, who works for the vocations office in Cleveland, and she's been on the podcast briefly. Um, uh, oh man, I'm probably forgetting the big ones, but those were the first three who come to mind. Amen. Um, I mean, I'll double down on Joel Barstad. You Mm -hmm. come away from a conversation with him and you go, hey, I want to make you my spiritual father, which is exactly (laughs) what I did. So um, I just got the privilege of spending some time with him and Leslie uh, during Mother Natalia's profession. I won't exclude present company because you two, uh, Mother, I don't know you as well, but I'm shocked by how much being around you affected me. Just, I, I don't... You, I, I, I've, I've told 30 people this, but like, for some reason I, I showed up and I met mother Natalia in person the first time, then sister Natalia. And you jumped up after sending me a funny picture on my way there. Like when, when are you going to get here? You know? And then you jumped up out of a coffee house or out of the outdoor patio, walked over and hugged me. And I felt like I was hugging someone that I've known for 20 years. Mm-hmm. I felt like I, I'm like I was seeing one of my oldest, dearest friends. It was there was a, a, a point, there was a, an aspect of which Christ radiates, reality radiates through you, and love radiates through you. That I I, it, I felt it, and it affected me immediately. And mm-hmm. it's it's been surprising and shocking, and and beautiful. And then from the first time I met Father Michael, we just started immediately finishing each other's sentences and just when we get together we start throwing gasoline on the same fire back and forth and it mm-hmm. it makes me want to be a better person and when it makes me want to see christ it makes me want reality um i'll definitely double down on blaha for sure uh, the the guy's just incredible and i mean uh and and, and you're talking about go i mean I, I just built a coffee house or designed and helped build a coffee house for um a spiritual son of Blaha's who was Blaha was his focus missionary <laughs> and now he's a priest too. And when I was talking about discipleship and, you know, you might not even know you're being discipled because it's so seamless and so human. He said, that's what Blaha did to me. Hmm. He was in discipleship for like two, three years and didn't know that he was in this program yeah. called discipleship because Blaha was so real and human. Another hmm. one that I'd throw out would be, um, um, obviously, the entire Schneer family. That's I mean, exactly what I was about to say. Justin and Oak Schneer, but the entire family. Yep, all three. Yeah, of us I mean, I mean, I yeah. when I am ready to just jump off of something or whatever, I just go to the Schneer's house. I sit down in my spot at the end of the uh, fire pit, and someone puts a glass of wine in my hand, and my goddaughter crawls up on my lap, and I end up with like four or five little girls crawling all over me, and I walk away going, reality is beautiful, and this is good, and goodness still exists in this world, and I want to be a part of it. You know, just it's absolutely. So, I mean, I, I got a list. I, I tend to collect these people and surround myself with them. Mm-hmm. You know, that's Those why... the I, kind of people you want to surround yourself with. Yeah, yeah that's why I loved um, meeting Father Ferentz and meeting uh, Father Boniface. Uh, your your life work. so I was like oh I just I just picked up two more okay <laughs> it's like it's so great yeah all right I'm gonna give a blessing um, thank you both thank you both for the time and and for, oh, the, for having me. so great it was good I may Lord bless all of you and keep you cause His face to shine upon you have mercy on you may our Lord 
send you forth into this world um, with the beauty, the joys, but also the crosses of true evangelization, of true friendship and community belonging, um, a desire to, to lose ourselves and give ourselves for the other and find uh, Jesus Christ in, in everybody you encounter. Um, may you be able to surround yourself with, with a community that truly awakens your desire and people that you are inspired by, also consoled by, people that become true community where you can be vulnerable and have all the risks that go along with that, that they may continue to inspire you to be more fulfilled in, in your membership of the body of Christ, more zealous for the kingdom of God, and more open to our Lord's actions in the salvation of your soul. May our Lord bless all of you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, love y'all. Thank you. Love you. Love you too. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.